treatment of gastroparesis is multifactorial. And honestly, the majority of patients are going to improve with just dietary therapy. So avoiding the foods that slow the stomach and then not eating large meals so the food has time to empty, although slowly, before it causes any side effects. So typically we'll tell patients to avoid raw fruits and vegetables. That tends to slow st stomach emptying. Caffeine, high fat foods. That can also mean spicy foods because most spicy foods, even if they're not perceived as high fat, they have a lot of oil in them to carry that spice. And then uh, things like smoking that also uh, decrease gastric emptying. So you wanna take all the confounding variables out, small meals, maybe five or six meals per day, liquid to softer based. Majority of patients are gonna do fine with that. You know, is that, does that mean that patients are gonna eat that all the time? No, that's a t totally unrealistic, right? So people go on holiday and whatever, but then they can manage it, right? So if, if they say, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have pizza because I want pizza, I know I might feel bad afterwards. You know, they make their choice, but they have the tool to manage their symptoms. And so dietary theory is a mainstay. And basically every patient with gastroparesis should see a dietitian with some expertise in the disease just to go through their diet and see if there's a way to manage the disease without even using medications. One of the reasons that gastroparesis is really, um, I guess, relatively shunned by uh, many physicians is we don't have great drug therapy. Right. So if you're in your office and you're a primary care doctor and you are seeing lots of different diseases, you, you want to be able to treat them. And when you can, it's, it's hard. It's hard for the patient. It's hard for the physician. Right now, we only have one FDA medication that's approved for gastroparesis, and that's a medicine called metoclopramide, or the trade name is Reglan. Unfortunately, it has a black box warning around it. So anytime there's a black box warning, you know, physicians don't really wanna um, prescribe it too much because there's some liability. And there's a lot of side effects, right? So Reglan it can be very effective. It's usually very effective when people initiate therapy, but there tends to be some accommodation to the therapy where the effect wears off over time, leading to increasing doses. And there's a dose dependent side effect profile that involves involuntary movements, involuntary movement, facial motions, jitteriness. And if those things occur, the medicine has to be stopped because if it goes on prolonged, those side effects can become permanent. And so very important to recognize those limitations. And when they are recognized, get the patient off the medication as quickly as possible. Unfortunately then, what are you gonna do for them? Because they were sick enough to need medications. What are other choices? Um, there's uh, a medicine that's available outside the United States called Domperidone. Um, was kind of available in the United States for a while through overseas pharmacies in Canada and uh, India and Australia. Um, the FDA has really come down on the people that were importing this drug, even though it, it works pretty well and it's generally pretty safe. It's not FDA approved and the FDA finally did kind of come down on several pharmacies and practitioners. And so much more difficult to get than it used to be. And uh, so while we still see people use it, uh, not quite as much as we used to, there's a side effect profile too. Probably the most uh, important one is that it elevates the prolactin level. There's a rare incidence of pituitary tumor formation. And for women that can mean that they're, they, be, they start lactating. And if that happens, clearly the medicine needs to be stopped, even if it's beneficial. Some medicines that are used in the hospital more are medicine uh, erythromycin, which is an antibiotic. Um, it is structurally similar to a molecule in the body called motilin. So it has a direct effect on the stomach to increase emptying. It's why the major side effect of erythromycin is, is nausea, is because people get this sort of hyperactive stomach nausea and they can't tolerate the medicine. Well, for somebody whose stomach doesn't empty very well, Erythromycin can be beneficial. Uh, works pretty well IV in the acute setting. There's very rapid accommodation to the effect, so it definitely won't work longer than about four weeks. And so prescribing it as an outpatient typically is not gonna work for most people, although it generally is tried. Uh, but it can be helpful in the hospital. So if somebody comes in with an acute gastroparesis exacerbation, 
IV infusions of erythromycin are indicated and, and can be helpful, and have been shown to be so in some of the medical literature. That's it for the medications, and I didn't say anything that sounded super good, so that's why we are here, I guess, a little bit today to talk about other therapies. Um, the next step in a lot of people's algorithm is to place an enteral tube. So that's a tube that goes in the body somewhere into the stomach or intestine so that nutrition can be delivered by liquid directly to the intestine. It's about as good as it sounds. Um, it can be really helpful in the acute management of people who've had gastroparesis for a long time who present very ill, very malnourished, not ready to have um, any type of surgical intervention or just need to have their nutrition balanced out to see what happens. And, and I've seen patients in the past who've had acute gastroparesis just have come in very malnourished, immune system depressed from their malnourishment, just sick as a dog for lack of a better term, brought them into the hospital, got them on enteral nutrition, usually through a jejunostomy tube, got their nutrition back and have them completely recover because the malnutrition was just exacerbating the problem so much that you have to sort those two things out. So the person who shows up very malnourished, enteral therapy is really indicated and probably six weeks, you know, a good trial, checking the laboratories, making sure the vitamin levels are normal, making sure the protein levels are normal, getting their immune system back to where it needs to be. And, and that person can, um, can sometimes not need any therapy and that does happen on occasion. So enteral therapy can be very helpful. Enteral therapy, however, is not what we call a destination therapy. What we mean by destination therapy is a long-term solution to the problem. First of all, enteral therapy requires a way to get the food to the intestine. So if it's not gonna be surgically, that means a tube through the nose that goes all the way through the stomach into the intestine. There's the data on that is just terrible. Um, those are okay things to do in the hospital where the patient is not going anywhere. But outside the hospital, those tubes are really tiny. They tend to get clogged. They tend to migrate back into the stomach, worsening the problem. You can imagine delivering a bunch of liquid nutrition into somebody whose stomach is not working right. That's not gonna be too good. Um, or they get pulled out on accident. People are asleep, they grab at things, and, and it just doesn't work out very good. So a temporary therapy with a tube in the nose is okay. Uh, longer than six weeks. There's almost nobody who makes it longer than six weeks with this kind of therapy. So if, we, if we're gonna consider doing enteral therapy as an outpatient, like do it, get them home, let them recover, we're almost always talking about a jejunostomy tube. And so there's, you're gonna see in these slides, there's several pictures of jejunostomy tubes. A jejunostomy tube is um, a surgical procedure, typically speaking. Uh, some people will do them at endoscopy, but that's not as frequent usually with surgery. Uh, it's a tube that goes through the skin, and there's a, there's a picture you'll see uh, into the intestine. This disease affects a lot of young women. There's a lot of body image issues with having a tube hanging out of your stomach. It's not a good thing, and it, they hurt. They always leak a little bit. There's always a little bit of seepage around it. it kind of smells bad, and it's gross. And So as a destination therapy, it's like not what we want. I mean, sometimes we end up in that corner but we should have exhausted many other therapies that you'll hear about in a minute before we end up there. So uh, it's good for the short term, not great for the long term. Another short term therapy, if the patient can't get enteral therapy, is IV nutrition, total parenteral nutrition, or TPN is what it's called. That requires an implantable IV catheter. Uh, that has its own problems with infections and implants. And then the nutrition, it but just cannot be as balanced as enteral therapy. Enteral therapy is sort of naturally occurring compounds. And there's lots of little micronutrients that we can't create in a bag solution that to help. And then the IV nutrition infections are a problem. So long-term IV therapy should be really be a rarity. It's very expensive, lots of complications. The catheters usually have to be changed out due to infection over time. And for somebody who's young, 30s or 40s, we should be looking for another answer for that person than long-term IV therapy, if we can find it, if we can find it. The next therapy, which is not surgical, is injection of the pylorus or the muscle at the end of the stomach with Botox. Botox is a naturally occurring compound that when injected into muscle 
essentially paralyzes the muscle. And so Botox makes that muscle at the end of the stomach open all the time. And so if your stomach is not emptying properly, we don't want a valve at the end of the stomach that's closed, right? We want it to be open all the time. So at least gravity will help the food go out. And so uh, Botox injection has been around for a long time. It's been studied on many occasions. There's a lot of controversy about whether it works or not. Yeah, in my experience, I don't do Botox injections, but I see lots of patients who've had Botox injected. It works about 20% of the time. And um, based on what we know about pyloroplasty as a therapy, Botox injection should work more frequently. And so I think the problem with Botox injection is not so much that it's theoretically a bad thing. I think theoretically it should work. Um, I think it's that it's very hard to deliver uh, from the end of an endoscope directly into the muscle at the right location to get it to relax. I think it's a, a little bit of a, you know, a crapshoot for lack of a better term to get it in the right spot. And so when it works for people, it's great. When it doesn't work, it doesn't. Um, typically what I see is for when it does work with people, they get one, two or three injections. And by the third, they're starting to get this accommodation to the effect and it's not working like it used to. And so then we'll pursue a surgical therapy. So, but it can be, and it usually works for about six months. And so, um, so it's worth, I think it's worth doing for people, but I, I also don't think it's a permanent solution for most people.